So it's a pleasure to be uh, at the home of Liberty is for Everyone uh, if you're an open carry activist and uh, talk about some of my recent open carry activism. So, you know, my talk is titled basically after a question I'm often asked why, why would, on earth would you carry an AR 15 in the airport? And I think one way to think about this, especially if you're an open carry person or a person who's interested in civil rights, is you may ask the question, what well, do you really need a reason, right? So if I propose to eat, say, a sherry, uh, you know, flavor ice cream cone, do I really need to justify that to anybody? Okay? I mean, it's my right, basically, to choose what sort of ice cream I want. And maybe you can also argue that, you know, it's uh, basically your right to carry a, carry a rifle. Of course, the consequences, in a sense, of, you know, carrying one of these versus carrying an ice cream cone around can be a bit more severe. And so that's usually uh, pe why people give you reasons you shouldn't carry any of the things like that. Uh, to the airport. So I like to think about the problem in terms of what are these reasons? What do people give as reasons that you shouldn't take you know, an airport uh, right to the airport? Okay? And you know, some people say, oh well, people will be very frightened and disturbed by this display. Okay, so you shouldn't have done this people are going to be scared. Okay? And I always point out that look, I don't expect anybody to really have any kind of rational fear about my truth in carrying an AM fifteen around. Okay? I mean, I'm just carrying my rifle in a safe manner. But so it brings me to the question of what, what really happened. Okay, so there's been a lot of media reports about this incident. And so I always like to also spend a little time here explaining what actually happened. And this is actually a map, okay, of Terminal 4 at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. And what and you can see there's a lot of uh, shops and so on. There's four security checkpoints, A, B, C, and D. And what I did was I decided to come in and I actually parked my car here in the East Parking Mall. And when I first came in, I actually made a mistake. I went in the stairwell, and I actually went up one level instead of going down to this, this picking one. And I was spotted there, apparently, by someone uh, who saw me carrying the rifle. And they apparently immediately took the elevator down and walked this whole distance of the terminal to find a police officer to report this to. And they started, apparently, a search. Somebody had reported that uh, there were some people who, apparently, they turned out to have fishing rods up some, on some high level of the parking lot. So the police immediately went up there. What I did was I came down the stairs, and this is a little cartoonish in the sense that the stairwell is actually to this side of the security checkpoint uh, rather than on this side. But I came out the stairwell, and what I first did was I went over to security checkpoint C, and I looked very carefully at the signage there to make sure that I was correct in my recollection that there was nothing stating that I couldn't, in fact, uh, approach the security checkpoint with a firearm or something like that. And I basically went out and walked right in front along the lines of the beginning of the security checkpoint here at security checkpoint C. I then crossed over, went over to security checkpoint B and did the same thing there. As I went by these security checkpoints, one thing I was looking for was actually what kind of scanners are in use there. Because as you know, the TSA has supposedly moved all of the backscatter X-ray uh, uh, scanners out of the major airports. They used to be deployed here, but they've been moved out of here and move to smaller airports, actually. How nice of them, right? So now they only irradiate people at smaller airports rather than larger airports. But I was also looking to see what kind of uh, scanners were in use. After I passed checkpoint B, I actually went along a uh, long walk uh, down along terminal four. And I believe the next slide here is a view down the terminal. You can see it's actually a long way, right? From, from one end all the way down there. I mean, uh, so it's a, it's a pretty long terminal. I walked along uh, these stopped here, for example, at the kids' shop. I looked, at, I think, at some Lego kits that were on display, uh, since my son is a big Lego kit person. And, you know, the whole time I was doing this and walking along, basically, it, it really didn't create too much of a disturbance, in the sense that, so, you know, I think most people at the airport are kind of busy. <laughs> They're like, hey, where's my gate? <laughs> Don't want to be late. Uh, a few people noticed me that I was carrying a rifle, some sort of approvingly, actually. Some others were kind of, hmm. But certainly nobody running and screaming or seeming to be frightened, okay, by by this uh, by a person walking with an AR-15. I continued along, passing all these shops. I went to security checkpoint A. I did the same thing there. I went very close to the line. There was a person standing right up near the end, and I I, stand, I stood close to him, and then looked down into the checkpoint, and then turned and went to this to the Starbucks here on the end, okay which was widely reported in the media that I had visited the Starbucks. And I chose to visit the Starbucks because, as you know, they are such uh, great friends of those of us who open carry our firearms. So I thought it was appropriate that I give them a, a 
should have done. This is so I went in and basically bought myself a hot chocolate. And this is one of those places where media inaccuracy becomes very apparent because they all said I was there to get coffee. It's not true. It was a hot chocolate. Right? Uh, while I was in line, again, I, I don't think the people serving me even noticed I had a rifle on actually until I until I turned because uh, I was carrying it actually in uh, patrol carry. People would call it right, muzzle down on my right side, my downward side. And after I got my hot chocolate, I started out. And as I started out, I noticed now. As I was approaching this area, then it's visible right outside the Starbucks. I was going to go over to this checkpoint and do the same thing there and walk close to the boundary. At this point, I saw a bunch of police officers approaching me quite rapidly um, from this side. One of them actually carrying my, I presume it probably was an M16, but you know, some sort of uh, rifle. Um, approaching quite rapidly, and a big gentleman comes up to me and says, What are you doing? You know, are you here to meet somebody? And I said, Well, uh, actually, you know, I'm I'm not being detained. <laughs> and uh, at this point, they couldn't really answer that question. And so they, they were like, I'm like, I'm going to go over to that checkpoint over there. Excuse me. And I started moving around this gentleman. And he jumped in front of me. He said, you can't go there. And I said, well, why not? Isn't the boundary between the open space and the federal checkpoint that line over there on the ground? I'm going to go over next to that line. And he's like, you can't do that. And I'm like, oh, so I am being detained. Am I being detained? They couldn't answer again. And I said, do you have any reasonable, articulable suspicion I'm about to commit a crime? They couldn't answer that either. At this point, a whole bunch of other police officers arrived and they started talking about, who is this? Is this this guy who was here before? Because I had been in the previous November. And they're like, uh, yeah, I think it's him. And they're like, we have to have a plan. And uh, you know, what's the plan here? They're demanding me, you know? I'm like, well, I think my plan is to finish my hot chocolate. So at this point, I asked them again, you know, am I being detained? Do you have a suspicion? They couldn't answer. They didn't answer the question. Actually, finally, I just said, "Am I free to go?" They didn't answer that question. I said, "Well, okay, I'm leaving." So I turned and I started walking back down the terminal in the other direction. And I walked along. Now I'm walking along this side here. And let's see. As I pass these, you know, the county attorney made a big deal about, "Oh, people are getting up from their lunch." Well, as I was walking along here, I was now not just a man carrying a rifle. I was a man carrying a rifle being followed by six police officers okay, at close distance. Well, this tended to create a lot more commotion okay, than what was previously the case. And this, these are the things that the county attorney observed okay, that were really caused actually by the presence of all these heavily armed police officers following this guy. Some people coming the other way were quite bemused by all this display, actually, I noticed. Uh, so I continued along here until I got back to security checkpoint C. And at this point, I, you know, I wanted to finish essentially my uh, hot chocolate before I went back in my car. I really don't like carrying open beverages in my, in my car. So I decided, OK, I'm, I'm going to go one more time and check security checkpoint C. So I came around the corner here. And at this point, I turned to the police because they had been having problems with me approaching that checkpoint. And I said, well, how close do you advise I can approach the checkpoint? And they said, well, it's the line over there. And you know, as long as we just don't want to see any operational interference with the checkpoint. So I went up and I walked along the checkpoint, not noticing any uh, operational interference. And I, then I turned around and I was going to go finish my hot chocolate at a series of seats that are over here. And as I did so, one police officer said to me, I assume somewhat but sarcastically, asked, well, do you mind if we hang out with you, you know, to protect your rights and all? And uh, so I told them, well, no, that's, that's all right. So since they seemed to want to hang around, I looked for a place where there were a bunch of seats that were open. And actually, this is the view from the security footage, which was uh, why they broadcast. You can see me in the red shirt over here with some of the accompanying police officers. And I saw that there was an open set of seats right here. So I decided to approach those seats so that they could actually sit down with me if they wanted to. You know, I, I guess I'm maybe too polite. And so I approached the seats, and my intention then was to rotate the muzzle of the rifle from the muzzle down to the muzzle up, because I wanted to sit down and set the muzzle on, the rifle on its buttstock. Uh, so being more stable and less likely to endanger anything. So as I approached it, I noticed that there was a TSA checkpoint directly across the way. So I didn't want to rotate the muzzle of the rifle in a direction that could be construed as pointing at anyone. So I looked, I scanned to my right, and I found a spot where there was basically a brick wall between, and nothing between me and the brick wall. So I rotated the muzzle of the rifle very carefully in line with that, okay, and then turned around and sat down. And I think actually this is the video uh, let's see if we can get it to play. Here it goes. It goes by pretty quickly. You can see me right there now. You can see I, I rotate the rifle muzzle up. I turn around, and now I set it down, and I start drinking my hot chocolate. Thank you very much. 
At this point, the police officers come up to me and they start asking me questions about well, what's going on. Did you laze those people over there or something? I'm like, laze them? So here's, here's where they come up, OK? Um, and there's a conversation that actually goes on right before this. Okay, here, by this time, they're telling me they're arrest me. So I get up and cooperate with them while they handcuff me. I think I also had to turn at this point. This guy was kind of just floating around with a rifle. So I had to point, you know, turn, say to him, uh, please be careful, it's loaded. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they realized that at that point. So the one, the one thing about um, what happened just before that, okay, was that before they decided to arrest me was they had a conversation with each other. And, and, and I overheard them say, uh, well, this has got to stop now. And they started this conversation about, well, what do we arrest this guy for? Okay? And they're like, oh, endangerment. Well, I don't know if it's endangerment. But you know they're going around with different charges. And finally, the one cop literally said to the other, go ask those people over there if they'd be willing to be a victim. And so one of the cops went over to some women who were sitting to the right. They're not in view here. Okay, and sort of uh, talk to them. Those women did nothing up to that point. Okay, they had not moved. In fact, I think they had even moved away. I mean, they weren't acting like they were threatened in any way. But the police somehow got them to say, oh, yeah, we felt threatened by this. Okay, so then they arrested me for disorderly conduct uh, with a weapon. It's a felony class six in Arizona. Two counts, right? One for each alleged victim. Now, you know, this brings us to the question, well, should people just be afraid of the fact that I'm carrying this assault rifle? Okay? Uh, whether it's, you know, it wasn't rotated or pointed at anybody uh, in any way, but, you know, shouldn't we be afraid of these semi-automatic firearms? And I think, you know, if you look, there was an article that had just recently come out uh, before I um, started talking about this incident. I had to wait a few months, obviously, so the legal issues were resolved. But there's an article that came out in the New York Times, the assault weapons myth. Right, which points out that only 2% of firearm violence involves rifles. Okay? Well, what that means is you're 49 times more likely to be injured by a handgun than a rifle. There's so so it's, it's really, there's no reason to be particularly afraid of a rifle versus a handgun. If anything, you should be more afraid of the guy carrying the handgun than the rifle, okay? from, a, from a sort of rational or logical point of view. But then people say, oh, oh my god, but an AR-15, it's an assault weapon. right? Well, of course, assault is a type of behavior, not a type of weapon, right? And furthermore, assault weapon is just a political term used by anti-gun groups, right? Uh, you know, even when we have the assault weapons ban legally, it's based on a bunch of what are essentially cosmetic characteristics, right? Whether you have a pistol grip, a barrel shroud, a flash suppressor. This has nothing to do with what makes a weapon a rifle particularly dangerous, okay? And in fact, you know, an M1 Garand, okay, uh, <laughs> which, you know, people don't call an assault weapon, actually has a much more deadly round, right? Here's a 223, what you're shooting is this little bullet out of an AR-15. I'm sorry, I'm a lot more afraid of this, okay, with all this charge behind it, okay, than I am about an AR-15, right? So, again, this is just sort of an unfounded fear that people have of seeing these. They, they think they're scary-looking weapons. Now, when people say, I don't care, and openly carry firearms, just too frightening, okay? You shouldn't be open carrying, okay? But the fact of the matter is, no mass shootings ever started with someone openly carrying a small weapon and then suddenly becoming a mass killer. In fact, criminals hide their guns, right, until the attack. And a perfect example of this was Paul Ciencia, right, the shooter at LAX who fired on uh, um, TSA officers, okay, actually carried his, his rifle into the line inside a gym bag, which means it would actually be more rational to be afraid of somebody carrying a gym bag with someone openly carrying a rifle, okay? If we were to look at this from a statistical probabilities point of view. So it really makes no sense, uh, this argument, that it's just too frightening to be open with any sense. And then other people tell me, oh my goodness, what if we can see, in fact, it was the news, the news anchor uh, in, in Arizona who has an interview with my attorney and says, well, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't somebody uh, who is concealed carrying a weapon just be justified in just opening fire and killing the guy if he's openly carrying like that? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's important to realize, of course, there are legal reasons for self-defense. You have to have reasonable grounds, imminent danger, serious bodily injury, or death. That's the reason you use lethal force. Okay, you don't use it because you think that the guy, the gun the guy is carrying is too scary. Okay? A, pers a person peacefully carrying a firearm is simply not reasonable grounds to feel threatened in this way to justify uh, using this. It's just a ridiculous notion.
And then people say, well, but still, why do this at an airport? I mean, don't we need to have extra security at airports? Of all places, for goodness sake. You know, we don't mind you carrying your, openly carrying your rifle here in Arizona, you know, down the street or, you know, to the grocery store or something like that. But gosh, to an airport? And the answer is really, frankly, not really. We don't need extra security at airports. The odds of dying in a terrorist attack are one in 20 million years of life. Okay? 20 million years of life. All right? And in fact, only about 3% of those attacks are on airports or airlines. Okay, which means you have to multiply that number by 33 to get 600 million years of life. Okay, one in 600 million years of life are your odds of dying in a terrorist attack on an airport or an airline. All right, it is simply unbelievably remote. We should worry about other risks in our lives, not these things. And it certainly doesn't justify being worried about what's going on in an airport to the extent that we do. In fact, there's much more important risks to worry about. Dying in a car wreck, one in 19,000. Okay, by comparison to one in 600 million, all right? Uh, or, for example, drowning in your bathtub, okay? About one in 800,000 years of life, okay? So, we just have a grossly disproportionate response, okay, to the chance of some sort of a terrorist attack, and there's no reason to be worried about this. But we have the TSA, right, that's supposed to be protecting us. It turns out the TSA actually decreases our safety, okay, through a number of mechanisms, right? It doesn't help us at all. We are, and the main reason is we're spending almost 10 billion a year, I think it's actually 8.1 billion, okay, on the TSA. There's a lot more effective things to do with $10 billion if your goal from a public health perspective is let's save people's lives, okay? For example, you can put bicycle helmets on kids, okay? If you give them out and so on and have programs to promote their use, all right, this will cost you on average about $120,000 per life save. Okay? If you figure out the odds of being killed or seriously injured in a bicycle accident if you're a child, okay, and the cost of putting helmets on kids. That is vastly more effective. All right? Or if you put tornado shelters okay, in the Midwest, in Oklahoma and so on, where there's a substantial risk of tornadoes, it'll cost you about $6 million per life saved. All right? In all likelihood, these interventions are 100 times more effective in terms of the benefit, the number of lives saved per dollar spent than what we are spending on airline security. Not 20% more effective, not 50% more effective, 100 times more effective. Our use of the money in the TSA is a gross, irresponsible waste of money from a public health perspective. Another way in which the TSA actually decreases our safety is the fact that they, it has, de in all likelihood, decreased the use of short haul flights. So people need to make a, a, a trip, and a typical example would be, say, Phoenix, LA, where it's about a six-hour drive, about a one-hour flight, okay? These are called short-haul flights. And these, the percentage of domestic flights, which are short-haul flights, has substantially decreased post 9-11. So we used to have about 34% of domestic flights, okay, for short-haul. It's about 27%. It's thought that a lot of this has to do with the hassles of security. So like, let's consider driving from Phoenix to LA. It's gonna take you an extra hour or two to get through security, okay? So now instead of a one hour flight, we're talking about three hours, okay, total, to get onto the airplane and get to the other end. And then in addition to that, of course, it's not the fault of this, but there's another part of the calculation. Do you need a car on the other end, right? So now you gotta go rent a car and so on at the airport versus just having your car and driving directly to your destination. So this is some of the reasons that people decide to say drive from Phoenix to LA rather than just getting on the airplane and flying. Okay? So since car travel is 170 times more dangerous than commercial airline flights, okay, and we know roughly the number of extra times people are doing this from this kind of uh, uh, calculation, we can actually figure out that probably the TSA is resulting in 500 excess deaths per year in the United States due to the fact that people are driving a more dangerous activity rather than flying. Okay? Now, these are real deaths. These are people actually dying on the highway versus some imaginary attack okay, or threat of a terrorist attack. That's one of the other ways that the TSA is really hurting us in terms of our security. The other way that they are hurting us is that the long checkpoint lines have actually attracted targets or potentially hurting us because we haven't really seen this happen. 
But if you think about it, here you have hundreds and hundreds of people in a very small crowd of space. Now, a terrorist could take a suitcase filled with you know, a nice explosive, a pretty large one, right? And haul it in there, and this is the line to check in. Um, so you could be hauling a pretty large suitcase, get in the mis- middle of this line and deck it, right? And injure potentially hundreds of people okay, from this bomb. But you know what? This hasn't happened. And of course, as I said, there hasn't been a rash of killings in these lines. Okay? I mean, in a sense, this is probably the clearest proof that the TSA has done nothing to actually improve our security. Because they created this enormous target, and yet there hasn't been any attacks on them. Okay? So something else must be causing us to be safe in our airports. But it can't be the TSA, because they can't be checking people into the line that's waiting to be checked into that. That would lead to an infinite regress, right? Okay. So this, I think, is when you think about it more carefully, you realize this is the clearest proof that the TSA does nothing actually to improve our security. Okay. So there's other problems here too, right? With the TSA. The TSA is constantly violating the Fourth Amendment, which text of which is here. Right? Right, if you can be secure in their person's house, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, except with a warrant. Okay, describing probable cause. What is the probable cause? I want to go fly on an airplane? That's probable cause to think that I am a terrorist or a criminal that you should be able to search? But of course, you know, the TSA, these people just want to travel somewhere, right? And I always like to point out, look, it's really the airlines that have a right to decide it, because the airplanes belong to them. Okay? They should be able to decide what is being done on their property. If they think it is reasonable and prudent okay, to require their passengers to be searched, then of course they can require that. Okay? But this isn't, the TSA is not what the airlines are saying to do, it's what the government is saying they have to do. Okay? So what I'm saying is the federal government has no reasonable grounds for a search in the vast majority of cases. I mean, maybe you could identify some people in the line that you'd think, okay, it's reasonable to search this guy. How do they justify it, right? Well, what they do is they say this is an administrative search. So there's this legal doctrine of administrative search, which says that if your primary purpose of your search is not to to initiate a criminal charge, okay, but rather just to look for some sort of civil violation, okay, that they can do these searches without the kind of probable cause that's required in the search scrutiny of the Fourth Amendment. Of course, this doctrine of administrative search requires three things. First, that it addresses an important government objective, that the searches are in fact effective at achieving that objective, and that they are doing so in a minimally evasive way. Now, I would disagree with the entire legal doctrine of administrative search, which was originally developed to justify uh, 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 housing inspections for uh, rat infestations in Baltimore. Okay, it, it, I think it's a very poor legal doctrine. But even if you say, okay, maybe that's a reasonable legal doctrine, Obviously, the TSA grossly fails to be effective. <laughs> okay, so they fail even this lesser standard for an administrative search, pretty clearly. I mean, we have the recent news uh, that they only catch 4% of attempts to smuggle contraband through their checkpoints. Only 4%. I used to think it was 15. It's actually only 4. And how is that going to deter a terrorist, okay, from trying to get something through their checkpoint? 4% chance you might be caught. Give me a break. Okay. So, you know, I, I think the solution, the appropriate solution here is we should give people choices in air travel again. And one size doesn't have to fit all. Airlines should be responsible for deciding what the appropriate trade-offs are. There's a trade-off between security on the aircraft and convenience in getting on the aircraft. And the market should really uh, decide on this. There's strong economic incentives for the airlines to get it right in the sense that while they might want to just load their planes full and make it really easy to get on their planes, it's also true that their insurers are going to tell them, well, look, you know, there's some risk bad things are going to happen when you're flying airplanes loaded with people, okay, over major metropolitan areas, okay, or bad things are going to happen to the people in the airplane. There's some chance bad things are going to happen. So we're going to have to require you, if you want to be insured with us at a reasonable rate, to do the following things, okay? And we should just let the market figure this out. It's also important to note, though, that for that to work, the airlines have to be liable for the damages that they may cost. And uh, there was an act passed after 9-11 which limits the liability of aircraft carriers to exactly the value of their insurance policies. How convenient. Okay, so we obviously need to get rid of that law as well. They should be strictly liable. They should be able to collect the profits. They should also be liable for any damage they cause by operating airplanes. And I think then we'll find the appropriate trade-offs. 
Uh, and, you know, this could give rise to a situation where different airlines at different terminals and airports actually can have different policies. Okay? Um, my suspicion is some people might prefer, and we've seen this a little bit with what's called TSA pre, okay, uh, where they'll, you know, pre-screen you, they do a background check on you, I think you pay $85 to do a background check, and now you just have to go through a metal detector, they don't take your shoes off. I don't know what the limit is. Uh, so, some people might prefer this, right, even more pre-screening. Okay, so airlines might actually tie this into, say, their uh, frequent flyer programs, okay, where, you know, basically they would know pretty well who you are, background check, maybe employment history, things like that, and then you have some sort of an ID card, and maybe they don't even bother to put it through a metal detector. They just figure you aren't at risk, you just walk on the plane, okay, because they know enough about your background. Um, it turns out there's a program that actually lets us replace the screeners that the TSA uses and change them from being government employees, federal government employees, to private companies that are doing the screening. And so one of the things in Arizona that we're trying to get going is basically all the airports in Arizona try to actually replace these government employees. It's been tried at about 20 airports around the country, and in those airports, not surprisingly, the people who work there under these private companies are a little bit more responsive to consumer complaints than the government uh, unionized employees. So it does seem to result in, in improvement in, uh, in service quality. So, you know, you go back and you look at that list of reasons I gave, and it just turns out the facts don't support these fears. I mean, you know, they're, they're just unfounded. You know, I used to always say irrational fears. Some people get down on me about their rational. So let's just say the unfounded, okay? There's really no foundation for people to be so afraid of someone openly carrying a rifle in a peaceful manner in airports. The fears are really just blown out of proportion to reality. Uh, my suspicion is it's kind of intentional right, on the part of the TSA, they want to overemphasize the risks of air travel and so on so that they can justify their continued existence, right? I mean, obviously all those people will be out of a job, or at least they'll have to work for private screeners, I guess, if uh, we move these things over to a private situation. And what's amazing about all this is despite spending $8.1 billion a year, okay, on screening passengers, the TSA has never conducted a systematic cost-benefit analysis of their rules and procedures, right? And for example, they're actually in direct violation right now of a federal court order to do so with respect to the body scanners. The case Epic versus DHS, okay, found in favor of the fact that they have to conduct a final rulemaking, okay, where they sit down and actually try to rationally evaluate the effects of deploying these body scanners, and they have refused to do so in direct violation of a federal court order. So they're technically operating illegally in that regard. And, you know, I like to find out, look, you know, if you have these fears and they're unfounded, essentially what people are doing is demanding others change their behavior in public places due to their misinformed fears. I mean, it's just, it's just completely irrational. I guess we all like everything that we're fearful of to go away in the world. And that's essentially what these people are doing, rather than actually dealing realistically with what people's fears are. So I point out that, look, carrying an AR-15 to the airport was really a, essentially a form of an emphatic protest, if you will, on my part of people trying to bully, intimidate, or force us to give up our rights, okay, due to the fact that they have some unfounded fear uh, that they just don't know really what they're doing. Uh, I guess I probably this group don't need to talk too much about essentially, you know, what, what do we need to do to improve this? And my friend Alan Corwin would say that, look, you know, people need to be made more aware of the basic facts about firearms, that education often helps to reduce fears, actually, if people become more familiar with firearms and are more educated about their use. They don't tend to be quite as uh, afraid. And finally, I come to this question, people say, but, but don't you, all oh, well and good, but don't you think, you know, I'm a gun rights guy, but I think you hurt the cause of gun rights by doing this. Okay, that's the other big objection. And, you know, I like to point out, like my, my attorney, Mark Bricker, does. Look, our rights and freedoms are defended at the edges. Okay, you don't defend free speech by defending the rights of people to walk around and say, oh, the weather's nice today. Okay, you defend free speech by defending the rights of hateful, uh, Nazis to march down the streets of Skokie, Illinois, spewing their nonsense, okay? That's how you defend free speech, all right? And similarly, gun rights are defended at edges, okay? They're not defended by, oh, a hunter can carry his rifle shooting a deer out in the woods. That's not how you defend the right, okay, the, sec the right that the Second Amendment gives us, okay? I also demonstrated, look, that peacefully carrying the AR-15 is legal in the airport, no crime was committed, and this is the right of American citizens. And the fact of the matter is, a lot of people in Arizona didn't know that it was legal to carry a firearm in the non-secured part of the airport. Okay? And I like, I like to point out, with respect to that point, 
But actually, the airport is probably safe for them. Okay? There's probably more people carrying their firearms, either concealed or openly, okay, in the non-secured side of the airport, which makes it a safer place to be. Because I think previously everybody thought, oh, it's illegal to even carry a gun in there. So even people who might normally carry a gun in there when going in to pick up a passenger or whatever, wouldn't carry a gun because they thought, oh, I'm not sure if it's legal. Well, now they know. Yeah. And I think, you know, look, Americans, unlike most people in the world, actually have the right to defend themselves and to own these tools. Right? And I think it's important to make that point in an emphatic way. Oh, and this is, yeah, here was, I explicitly put down my point about people knowing that it's legal to carry. And I think that it has started, and it started a critical discussion, both in Arizona and actually on a national stage, of, you know, the nature of these fears uh, and of our rights. And so I think that's also a productive thing that comes out of such a process. And you know, I'd like to know finally that you know, it's not all doom and gloom here, right? That some of our rights are being restored despite what you might think here. Uh, when the TSA asks, please remove any remaining civil liberties and place them in the trade. Okay. Uh, despite what might, you might have the impression, right, we've seen 40 states uh, you know, in the last decade or so pass shell issue concealed carries. Uh, well, I think obviously we still have a lot more work to do, especially in the areas of uh, restoring the right to travel without unreasonable searches. All right, there's some contact information, and uh, I guess you guys can answer questions. Thank <clears throat> you.